to the Cybersecurity for Healthcare online event. My name is Vishal Mutta, and I'm the program director for this event. This morning, we will highlight some incredible stories of how the healthcare industry is striving cyber resilience and adapting to the new normal that we find ourselves in through preparation, training, and most importantly, awareness. I'm also grateful that we can actually create a platform for your leaders to benchmark and share learnings and challenges through this virtual environment. As for what's in store for this morning, I hope you're excited because we do have a jam-packed agenda for you. First, we'll be hearing from Ashwin Ram on the key security recommendations to prevent attacks and protect patient zero. Next, in line, we'll have Alistair Vickers talk to us about how he's developed a streamlined digital environment to transform and uplift capabilities around security at two or our compass health. Then we'll be featuring an interstate panel discussion on cybersecurity 2021, where you'll have a group of panelists across Australia and New Zealand coming together, uh, cybersecurity experts in their own right, talking to how they're adapting their approaches and uh, rethinking their cybersecurity environment and strategy for the upcoming uh, future. And finally, we'll hear from Mark Smith from Okta on modern identity strategies for today's healthcare IT. And look, together in person, I would encourage you to make the most of this event by being as interactive as you can through the facilities we have provided. So the facility there is the Q&A box. So please make sure you're asking as many questions as possible because we will have a live Q&A session uh, running post the uh, presentation. So it will be an opportunity to actually get your voice heard and have some of the key challenges addressed. And we also have a discussion forum amongst the attendees itself, where you can just post and interact uh, with your peers that are online with you, share any good thoughts that uh, perhaps came out of the presentation. But yeah, do keep the engagement going. And uh, finally, I would like to offer a special thank you to all our speakers for their time in preparation and for our spon sponsors, Checkpoint Software and Okta, without whom such events would not even be possible. Without further ado, I'd like to first uh, take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker for this morning, Ashwin Ram. Ashwin is the cybersecurity evangelist in the office of the CTO uh, at, the, at Checkpoint Software Technologies. Ashwin works with organizations to help them develop their cyber response strategies. Ashwin, over to you uh, for a short introduction and for your presentation. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Vishal. Folks, thanks for joining this session. So here's the game plan. Right? We will first look at why uh, we need to protect patient zero. And we will look at uh, trying to understand um, you know, what is the current state of play. So that then we will uh, look at uh, what is going on in the threat landscape um, in general and also from uh, from the context of healthcare. Then we will look at how do we actually protect patient zero and I'll share with you some uh, tips and technologies to address this. Then we'll look at what must you do if you fail to protect patient zero. So much of what I will be sharing with you are recommendations that we've been making for a long time now. Um, but it's really good to see that uh, independent studies are now also recommending this. So the insights I will be sharing with you come from various sources. The first one is uh, the 2020 cost of a data breach report. Now for this, the Poneman Institute carried out an in-depth study of uh, by interviewing more than 3,200 individuals from over from roughly 524 organizations that had experienced a data breach between August 2019 and April 2020. At Checkpoint, we have an incident response team who last year responded to over 3,500 calls for help globally from organizations that uh, were either under an attack or had just been breached. So I think it's uh, important to learn from their insights because they see what is working and uh, what is not. Now let's start by looking at the current state of play for healthcare and the impact of COVID-19. Now our Intel at Checkpoint shows a sharp rise in attacks against healthcare as you can see here. Spear phishing based uh, attacks uh, that are leveraging the pandemic related themes are the most common uh, used tactics. At its peak, we saw over 20,000 attacks related to COVID-19. 
the popularity of Zoom and other video conferencing uh, platforms during the pandemic period also made it a very trendy target. Cyber criminals look to exploit news of the day. And uh, we saw a trend where threat actors were changing their threat campaign based on the various different stages of the pandemic. So, for example, in the beginning, everyone wanted to know uh, what the symptoms were for COVID-19 and where the hotspots were located. So threat actors used this to their advantage. Then some of the countries started to roll out stimulus packages. This be um, became a theme. As uh, some countries opened up for business, threat actors looked to embed malware within CVs and resumes. On the mobile front, our researchers discovered 16 different malicious applications, all masquerading as legitimate uh, COVID-19 apps, uh, which contained a range of malware from stealing user data to generating fraudulent uh, revenue from premium uh, rated services. The pandemic, of course, changed, the, um, changed how, where and when we work. Many cloud projects and uh, remote access projects had to be rushed so that uh, companies could be aligned and agile. Uh, this rush meant that uh, many projects didn't go through proper governance and assurance processes. And this led to many security oversights. And we are seeing the result of these even today as threat actors look to exploit these security oversights. Let's now take a look at how long it takes organizations to identify and contain the security oversights that are being compromised and, and exploited. So according to the Poneman Institute, the global average time to identify and contain a data breach is 280 days. And when we look at Australia, the result is even worse. In Australia, threat actors are spending on average 296 days in our environment before the activities are identified and contained. And when we look at, uh, at the average time it takes for healthcare industry to identify and contain a breach, the, unfortunately, the news is even worse. Threat actors are spending, on average, 329 days creeping around environments, moving laterally, trying to understand various parts of your environment going from one part of your network to another part of your network, trying to understand how they can monetize their victims as much as possible. So they're spending two, uh, 329 days before these activities are identified and contained. So the healthcare industry has a lot of work to do. And when we need to do a better job at this to reduce the time frame, because obviously the longer a threat is in your environment, the more damage uh, it can cause. Now, in this study, the researchers also worked out the average cost of a breach based on breach life cycle. You can see here that the longer it takes for you to identify and contain a breach, the more it will cost your organization. In 2020, for example, you can see that breaches with an average life um, uh, of more than 200 days, which is the time it takes to identify and contain uh, a breach, costs on average more than 1.12 US dollars more, million dollars more than if the breach was identified and contained in less than 200 days. And uh, when we look at the percentage change uh, in average total cost of a data breach from previous years per country, it's not good news for Australian organizations in general because the cost of a data breach has gone up by nearly 10%. Now, clearly not a, uh, not a trend that we want to be maintaining. If I can draw your attention to the bottom of the graph, you can see that organizations in South Africa, France, Italy, and Germany have all managed to reverse this trend. So it is possible. But the big question now is, what are they doing that we are not? And the answer is that they're doing a better job at addressing the big ticket items that I'll be sharing with you a little later. Now, by the way, while the average cost of a data breach is estimated to be US uh, $3.86 million, the average cost of a data breach in healthcare industry is way more at $7.13 million. That's US dollars. And this trend is going in the wrong direction as well. It's an increase of 10% from previous year. So the Poneman Institute actually provided us with the root cause of uh, the breaches that they investigated. So we can clearly see what the big ticket items are. 
that need the most urgent attention. These are where most organizations are still failing to implement effective security controls. Now, folks, if you want to protect patient zero, you have to make sure you have to make sure that all of these attack vectors receive the most urgent attention. So the number one attack vector, and again, I want to be just very clear that uh, most organizations will have security controls for this, but the problem is that it's not very effective. So as you're listening to this and you're looking at the top ve attack vectors, ask yourself, do we have effective security controls for this? And are our policies configured to be able to identify and block these threats? So the number one attack vector, according to the Parliament Institute, that is being com um, exploited by threat actors is compromised credentials. So 19% of organizations that had experienced a data breach, according to this report, failed to prevent corporate credentials from falling into the wrong hands. Another 19% of the breaches, that's nearly one in every five breach, uh, was due to cloud misconfiguration. Most organizations have a cloud adoption strategy. Now, incident response team have noticed a huge rise in cloud-based attacks. 16% of breaches were due to vulnerabilities in third-party software. So you have to have a robust vulnerability and man vulnerability management game plan. Having a well-segmented network is also essential in preventing threat actors from moving laterally in your environment once they've exploited a vulnerability. So this is where having a zero trust approach is also important. Next, uh, I've actually grouped phishing and business email compromise together because typically business email compromise starts with a phishing attack. These two attack vectors were responsible for more than 19% of breaches. These five attack vectors was utilized by threat actors for nearly three quarters of the breaches. So make sure you ruthlessly prioritize security controls for these top five attack vectors and reevaluate the effectiveness of these controls. The checkpoint incident response team have worked many cases where um, businesses had these controls, but it was ineffective. So as part of your cyber risk assessment, I urge you to identify the effectiveness of your security controls. I know it's a lot of work, but it will be worth it. Make sure you understand where you are vulnerable and deal with it. Now, please make sure you assess the risk of all of these uh, attack vectors that pose to the risk that they pose to your organization and, and uh, have a strategy to deal with it. Now, last year we had uh, warned uh, and uh, seen a trend that we dubbed double extortion. Now, this was essentially attackers having two bites at the cherry. They would first steal your data and then encrypt your systems. Then they would uh, threaten to publicly release the sensitive data they had unless you uh, unless you paid up. Next, they would demand a ransom for the decryption key. And if you didn't pay up the initial ransom, then the cost of the decryption key would be much higher. Unfortunately, threat actors are always looking to update their strategy to monetize their victims as much as possible. They have a new technique now, which uh, we've called triple extortion. It is essentially an expansion on the double extortion ransomware technique, integrating an additional unique uh, threat to the process. So the first triple extortion case was seen in Finland where a psychotherapy clinic suffered a data breach resulting in over 40,000 patient records being stolen. This was in October last year. A ransom was demanded from the healthcare provider to not make the patient data publicly available. But surprisingly, a small sum was also demanded from the patients themselves who had received a ransom demand via an email. Now, one of the patients who, who was victimized was already depressed and terminally ill. And uh, he was now being threatened that uh, his most private intimate conversations about his personal life and his mental health issues would be made public. Now, this poor guy was dealing with the news that he had only one year to live. And at the same time, a cyber criminal was trying to exploit him because the clinic failed to protect his records. This victim, um, the victims of this uh, attack also included vulnerable children. So you see the healthcare sector, their inability to protect and keep these types of personal data safe 
can and will be used against the sick and the vulnerable in our community. This is why you must protect patient zero. So how do we do this? How do we protect patient zero? I think it's important to start with the right mindset. And uh, when it comes to cybersecurity, it's a prevention mindset. When it comes to patient records, sensitive information about our sick and the vulnerable, you must protect the data by preventing attacks. Also, the more threats you, pre um, you prevent, obviously, the less you have to remediate. Now, our incident response team have also worked many cases where we've analyzed the um, post-breach incident. And we've revealed that most of these attacks, these so-called sophisticated attacks, could have been prevented. So it's really important that you understand that most of the attacks that you're seeing in the media being known as uh, called uh, sophisticated can be prevented. And I want you to understand that most of these breaches can be prevented, right? So you have to change your mindset. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to be able to prevent 100% of the attacks. So this is why your defense strategy must also be paired with automatic remediation. If you have manual processes, you must automate them as much as possible. Next, uh, we need to address uh, the culture of an organization. What I mean by culture in this context is that everyone in your organization must understand that cyber is everyone's responsibility not just the responsibility of the cyber team. And this mindset needs to start at the very top. The CEO and other executives must be part of your organization's cyber security committee. You must also continually update your cyber security awareness training to reflect the tactics being used by the current threat campaigns. Threat actors will use every tactic they can in this example, you can see ACSC had sent out a message to the healthcare sector to advise them that SMS phishing campaigns attempting to steal credentials via text message. So make sure your users are aware of these types of phishing campaign. And also, you should be asking yourself, do we have security controls to identify and block these types of uh, threats, especially um, as more and more users are accessing and processing corporate data on mobile phones? So make sure you have security controls deployed on mobile phones to block as, um, access to phishing sites, uh, no matter how they are received. Make sure you can protect users even from never before seen phishing sites. Make sure you have a way to prevent users exposing corporate credentials to sites that don't belong to your organization. Now, needless to say, security controls to identify and prevent uh, damage to ransomware, um, damage from ransomware uh, attacks must be at the very top of the list for any CISO. My recommendation here are as follows. Validate that you are investing in effective endpoint security via third-party tests, independent tests. Take a look at how well the security controls map to MITRE ATT&CK framework. Now ask yourself, can your endpoint security provide forensics to identify what the threat was? How did it get into your environment? What did it do? What was the business impact of the attack? Was there any data stolen? Did it move to other systems? Did it automatically, did the threat automatically um, get remediated as part of our EDR solution? Do we have full visibility of the attack chain? These are critical questions that must be answered very quickly in an automated fashion. We've seen time and time again how organizations after days, weeks, are still unaware of how the threat actually entered their systems. This is really important for you to take into consideration. Now, phishing emails that contain a malicious file are typically office documents and PDFs. One of the most effective way to address um, threats embedded in these types of file is to use content disarm and reconstruction. Basically, you are sanitizing the document by removing anything that could be used to weaponize it. This technology, when combined with sandboxing, provides a very powerful threat prevention strategy. In this example, 
uh, we are taking a Word document and reconstructing it with only known good parameters and removing any active content that could potentially be malicious. Now, another option is to simply convert some Office documents to PDFs that neutralizes any possible threats that are. This technology can be as simple as a browser plugin, which means that you can effectively protect threats that uh, your users receive, even via personal emails. Next, I want to touch on cloud. In the last five years of working cloud incidents, it's clear to us that many organizations still struggle with the whole uh, responsible uh, um, shared responsibility model, right? Especially when it comes to moving from infrastructure as a service to software as a service to the container and serverless stuff. So, yes, we have uh, you know faster ways of doing things, but security is still your responsibility. We see organizations make same simple mistakes over and over and over again. And all of these center around vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. Nine out of 10 times, um, the calls that we receive, um, that are received by our incident response team in relation to cloud breaches end up being something as stupid as Bitcoin miner. Attackers are doing the same thing they've done for the last 20 or 30 years of the internet, which is to look for vulnerable services and exploit them for their own gain. And if you're using legacy systems, be aware that attackers can and will exploit them. If you have Active Directory connected to your cloud infrastructure, be very careful because attackers are heavily targeting these and we've seen countless breaches. We've worked a recent uh, case where an organization called us for, for help. They wanted to understand how they'd been breached. They had fairly tight security controls, but within a very short amount of time, we were able to tell them that one of the admin panel was exposed to the internet. The attacker was able to access the admin panel, get root on the server, and then started mapping out how they could move laterally in the environment. What they found was that there was a VPN connection back to the corporate network that led to a database. And well, it didn't end very well for this organization. Now, a new trend that we're seeing is that more and more attackers are looking and going after API keys that give them a huge amount of control. And really, not a lot of good hygiene around this when we look at uh, many organizations. So make sure you address this. We're starting a managed uh, detection and response service here at Checkpoint. And one of the first things that we did was turn on our cloud posture management solution. And it became very clear to us that most customers don't appreciate how dynamic cloud environments are. The rate at which uh, things are spun up and torn down is just incredible. Right. So the key to cloud security is visibility and control. Make sure you have a way to visualize all your cloud assets and a way to automatically remediate misconfigurations. If you have a cloud adoption strategy, then cloud posture management tool must be a non-negotiable on your cloud on your um, security control strategy. Now, for many organizations, the lack of skilled staff make it very difficult uh, to manage and stay on top of uh, cybersecurity challenges. So it makes sense to look for security partners to provide MDR services. As you are evaluating uh, MDR providers, please make sure that you take the following into consideration. Do they have in-house security expertise? What I mean by this is, do they have a dedicated security research team for endpoint, dedicated security researchers for cloud, dedicated security research for network threats, for IoT threats, for mobile threats? Do they have a 24 by seven SOC team and an incident response team that spans the globe? Do they have expertise in uh, securing different platforms and environments such as the cloud, endpoint, network, mobile, IoT? Can they provide full visibility to all your cloud IT um, environments? Really important that you take all of these things into consideration. It's, uh, it is important for you to realize uh, that infusion pumps, patient monitors, MRI scan uh, machines, uh, clinical refrigerators are all inherently vulnerable and easy to hack. These devices were designed with little or no security in mind. And the reality is that most organizations don't actually know how many IT, IoT devices exist in their environment. 
So cyber criminals um, are looking to exploit this because it's an easy way for them to enter your environment. So make sure you have a strategy to identify and secure your IoT devices. Now, one of the things that uh, you'll need to do is gain visibility. We've partnered with Medigate to address this security risk for uh, medical IoTs. So this partnership can provide you with uh, a comprehensive and accurate um, discovery of all your connected medical IoT devices. It can uh, help you auto-generate security policies on uh, based on uh, device attributes. This partnership can help you protect your IoT devices from network-based attacks. So let's take a quick look at how this partnership can secure your medical IoT device. Next, uh, I'd like to talk about legacy systems so within healthcare. Now, you must have a strategy to update your infrastructure and get rid of old legacy systems. And one of the main reasons you need to do this is because threat actors are still exploiting vulnerabilities from more than 10 years ago, and they're being successful at it. Often, legacy systems won't receive patches, which make them very dangerous. Virtual patching must be part of your vulnerability and patch management strategy. Now we get it, patching systems takes time and sometimes you can't take systems offline to patch. But cyber criminals aren't going to wait for you to patch your systems. So you have to focus on preventing attacks before they reach these vulnerable systems. Make sure your intrusion prevention systems are configured in line with best practice. Make sure you are automating the downloading of IPS signatures. Don't be the long hanging fruit. Now, there are so many other areas that I haven't covered when it comes to protecting patient zero. Uh, we just don't have the time. The Polymer Institute also provided us with 25 key factors that impact the cost of a data breach. So I'll go through these because they also um, should receive the most urgent uh, attention in your cyber resilience strategy. So according to this uh, report, uh, testing and fine tuning your incident response has the biggest impact in reducing the cost of a breach. Now this also goes a long way in minimizing the damage a threat actor can cause. Implementing an effective business uh, continuity plan is very important. Just having an incident response team will actually reduce the cost of a data breach. Now, Rounding up the top four is AI-based platforms. What they're saying here is that platforms that can automate the your uh, and orchestrate your cyber security response um, is, is going to play a critical part. So if you are not doing this already, I recommend you invest time and understand the benefit that automating your incident response can deliver to your organization. 
This is a this is a game changer because uh, even if an attacker manages to compromise your environment, um, the speed at which you respond can be the difference between the threat actor gaining access to those patient records or not. Uh, investing in red team um, training as well as security awareness training, of course, um, encryption technology and threat intelligence show all reduce can reduce the um, impact of a breach. And uh, let's now focus on what can actually add to the, this complexity. And the worst thing you can do when it comes to your cyber resilience strategy is actually keep throwing more and more security um, point products, right? Because this leads to complexity, which then leads to the, the time it takes to identify and contain these breaches. Having cloud strategies that go wrong can also add a massive cost to your data, uh, to your uh, cost of a breach. So again, very important that you have uh, visibility and control around these uh, these environments. Skill shortages, of course, another thing that you've got to be addressing. And one very easy way to do this is by automating as much of your incident response uh, plan. Folks, everything that you see here on the screen must receive attention in your cyber resilience strategy. Now, many of the organizations that called us for help had incident response plans, but when it was put to test, many of them failed miserably. So make sure you get your incident response playbook validated by third party incident response teams who do this for a living. They've seen more incident response plans fail than you could possibly imagine. So get them to validate and help fine tune your incident response plan. You have to do tabletop exercise under these new normal conditions. One of the key learnings from our incident response team is that most organizations um, don't have a platform to enable effective cross-company communication um, and collaboration between key stakeholders. The legal team, your PR team, your executives don't actually have a platform to effectively communicate with each other and with uh, the incident response team. Now, if your email systems in your active directory has been hit with ransomware, then how are you going to collaborate? if that was your primary means. We've heard of organizations that have had to revert to WhatsApp chats because they had no other service or they had no other choice. So ask yourself, do we have a platform for crisis management that will allow all our stakeholders to effectively communicate? If you, um, if you don't, then it's, uh, it's time for you to invest in one. Also, it's crucial that healthcare organizations are communicating with each other and sharing threat intel. I'm actually working on building this capability. So if you are interested in accessing a platform that will allow various healthcare organizations to effectively communicate with each other and share threat intelligence, reach out to me. Now, the best way to reduce the impact of a breach, in my view, is to utilize security orchestration, automation, and uh, response platforms. A good SOAR platform can help you reduce the workload on your SOC team by automating and orchestrating uh, incident response tasks so that your team can make important decisions quickly and with much more context and accuracy. It can help provide a crisis management platform for all your stakeholders and your incident response team. SOAR platforms can help you maximize your investment in existing security tools that you've got and provide a connectivity fabric. And uh, importantly, it can help triage threats so that your SOC team can prioritize the most dangerous threats first. If you want and you do want your team to prioritize those most dangerous threats to your organization. So to wrap up, focus on prevention. Prioritize the big ticket items that can help you address these challenges and uh, consolidate your security. Make sure you have visibility and control around your cloud and all your IoT assets. So please reach out to me and I can help you with gaining visibility into your cloud and your IoT assets. We can help you fine tune your cyber resilience plan. We can use the, the visibility that we gain from, uh, from the various tools that we have to start helping you map out and strategize your cyber resilience strategy. Uh, do a tabletop exercise. Now, we do this for many in, um, organizations in various industries. So don't wait until it's too late. Let's test your response and, uh, and see how well you do with our, our global incident response team. And then we can use this to fine tune your response. Uh, invest 
time and understand how security automation and orchestration and response platforms can help you protect patient records. Thank you. I think we can now move to uh, Q and A. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, enjoyed and and found the session in, insightful so far. That if you've got any questions, please uh, please ask away. Thank you, Ashwin. That was a great great presentation. You not only touched upon some actual awareness pieces, but you also offered people a tangible way to take some steps and move forward in terms of. Uh, yeah, the education piece and actually learning about what's possible. And I guess to that end, the question has come in as well around you mentioning the importance of automation in uh, incident response. So they're asking, do you have some good examples of what that might look like? Certainly. Look, there are some really, really good um, saw providers out there, right? Um, and so, so have a look at them. Have a look at what Gartner is saying uh, around this. But what you want to do is make sure that uh, the the saw platform that you actually invest in, first of all, is vendor agnostic. Um, one of the really good ones that we we've partnered with is uh, Simplify, right? Uh, now, Simplify has over 200 integration partners and, and 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 all of them you know so all of the big players in the cybersecurity space are, are part of that including all the seam platforms so that's what i would recommend that, that you focus on now the other thing that these platforms um, allow you to do is is uh, very easily drag and drop pre-built um, incident response playbooks so that you can automate those mundane tasks hopefully that answered the question Yep, yep, no, that's perfect. And uh, I guess we have one more question from my side, specifically around cyber insurance, right? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And what role does it have to play in securing an organization of today or the future? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so let me think about that. Um, a couple of things. So first of all, I think we have to change this mindset so many organizations have around cyber insurance as being a free get out of jail card, right? Um, you can't do that, especially in healthcare, because just like I showed you, right, triple extortion, now patients are gonna still pay the price. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you, address that like with the cyber insurance you can't right like when when some sick and vulnerable are being now extorted and, and, and been victimized so that's the first thing so for the healthcare industry i don't think you should be looking at that as a get out of jail card the second okay. thing that we're seeing is especially i don't know if you guys um, are across this but but recently there was a massive breach in in the, in the us right the pipeline breach that happened yep mm -hmm. and i mean how, that's breach is going to cost in billions right so cyber insurance companies are going to struggle to pay these kind of rents now we're already seeing um some cyber insurance companies now pull out of this business and say you know what we're not going to be in this business because it's just going to be too expensive so so that's mm -hmm. a trend uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that you might want to be careful of the other thing actually that i just thought of is this we know that threat actors are actively targeting cyber insurance organizations. And the reason they're doing that is because they are after that customer list that has all of those uh, um, that are paying cyber insurance because they know that if they go after those organizations specifically, then they have a better chance of being paid the ransom. So, so okay, yeah. be very careful when it comes to cyber insurance. No, very, very, very important thoughts there. And look, I guess you've, you've sparked some more thoughts in people's heads. We've got uh, a couple more questions coming here. Uh, so Arnie uh, Riedel is asking us, how big a threat is IoT, such as infusion pumps or even ultrasound to packs? Um, how, how big a threat is it? I, I think yeah. it's... It, it's, it's you know the world is only going to wake up i think when people start to die unfortunately and and you know like we've been i've been warning about this stuff it, it worries the hell out of me look we've we have this um capability where we can actually take firmware from iot devices and run it against our system and actually see what kind of vulnerabilities and threats may be embedded in it and what we found is that uh, a lot of these firmware uh have for example um, passwords that are hard coded in there. So it could be complex passwords, but it's hard coded. And, mm -hmm. and those passwords, those database exist on the dark web. 
right? So, so it's very easy for attackers to compromise that. These vulnerabilities, uh, the firmwares have vulnerability in them that can be um, very easily bypassed. These are, um, um, you know, level 10 vulnerabilities that I'm talking about. So it's very easy for threat actors to be able to compromise this. In fact, we've done multiple POCs to show this. There, there's actually a very concerning video that uh, that was recorded by our own researchers where they compromised uh, a X-ray machine and then changed the actual uh, data or the X-rays on there. They encrypted it. They could also manipulate that. So um, this is uh, this is definitely something to be very concerned about, especially when it comes to nation state threat actors, especially especially the Lazarus group, these are the, the North Koreans, right? These guys are looking at these kinds of uh, kinds of attacks. So it's only a matter of time before before um, the Lazarus group um, start to exploit this. Uh, very easy to be compromised. And the other thing is that most of us just don't even have visibility. I'll give you one quick story. So I was talking to mm -hmm. a colleague of mine in the US, uh, and we did this, uh, um, uh, we did this, uh, well, they did this, uh, um, uh, discovery session with uh, with a hospital, and uh, it turned out the hospital didn't know that they had the, all these extra infusion pumps in the environment. They were actually about to to place an order for uh, infusion pumps um, because they thought they needed more. Yet they had it all in the environment. They just didn't have visibility. They didn't know it was actually connected. That this visibility didn't exist. So if you don't have visibility around this stuff, then how mm -hmm. the hell are you going to protect it and you know prevent attacks? So Here's my thing, right? Get in touch with us and we can help you with that. We can help you with the visibility piece. So at least you know what to do next and we'll help you with that. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds like there's two pieces to this, right? There's the bit that first you need to wake up to the real threat and then there's the, the need to have a conversation around what does that actually look like? And that's where you guys are obviously playing a role and hopefully, uh, yeah, we should start to see more conversations and more interest as well, right? Sure. I guess people are foundationally aware of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, to have a more media discussion, certainly you're making some interesting points there. And yeah, uh, you know, one thing I would say, Vishal, is getting these visibilities is is, is really easy, right? Mm. Reach out. It, it doesn't take a lot of time and effort, but the 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 benefit that you gain from this is incredible. So don't delay that. Like cloud visibility, IoT visibility, this should be like no brainer. Uh, if you, yeah, yeah, please reach yeah, out. Yeah. We, we can help you with this stuff. Now, don't be the longing food. Fair enough, fair enough. And uh, uh, I guess we've got one last question. Perhaps we, we have time to cover. We have yeah. approximately two minutes here. So mm -hmm. uh, Rohit uh, Thirumala has asked us, in, relate, in relation to biomed devices, can you explain the best possible approach to avoid breach? As you suggested, they are the most vulnerable. I think you've already covered your answer a bit, but yeah, have a go at it again if you'd like. Okay, so let's start with basically the first thing you want is uh, visibility, which I talked about. Architecture is super, super important, right? So what I mean by here is you have to focus on segmentation and micro segmentation where possible. Now, the problem we see with segmentation is that is that you many organizations are not deploying effective security controls to prevent a lateral movement of the threat. So segmentation doesn't mean that you just have multiple VLANs and you segment. No, you've got to have effective security controls that can identify those threats. So in the event that there is a part of your network is breached, you can contain it there. So that's really, really important. And the thing is that you can't segment and have effective security controls unless you have really, really good threat intelligence. So threat intelligence plays a huge part in this, right? And then your threat intelligence also needs to be backed by AI and machine learning and all of that capabilities. So there's there's lots of parts to this. It's not like that easy, right? Yeah, yeah. There's not yeah, one particular thing. Why. You yeah. need to work with us so that we can help you with these strategies. We can do the compromise assessment. We can help you come up with a two, three, five year plan on how we're going to address this. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, uh, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. You can see Ashwin is quite passionate and feel free to reach out to him. He'll be more than happy to uh, share some of his thinking on how you can probably get more uh, secure in your cyber security uh, journey. So with that, uh,